So good afternoon everybody. Salam alaikum. I will not make it long uh, because we want to hear who's speakers. Uh, I just want to thank the President for the trust that uh, she uh, put in all of us to prepare this exhibition and this conference, which I repeat was a collective effort. And I also thank each of you for being present uh, because it's for you that uh, we did it and it's much appreciated that you are there. We have organized the afternoon uh, in this way, not forgetting that MacDonald in his grave must think, why are they all here? At this time of the year, I was, I was also uh, usually already in Pemaquit Pond in Maine because I found that Hartford was too hot. And so he would escape every summer to the north, uh, so he must wonder why we are all here. Uh, we will have uh, Five speakers, two, uh, we, yeah, three speakers, no, two speakers first, then a tea break. There will be no tea, but there will be cold drinks uh, due to the season. Uh, and they will be found in the other room behind uh, this room. Our first speaker is uh, Professor James Smith, who was for many years he had Hartford Seminary and has accepted to come back uh, to celebrate uh, with us. Uh, Duncan Black MacDonald. Then we have Professor Musawi, who is coming from Columbia University in New York, who will speak about uh, the Arabian Nights, and Professor Smith will have spoken before that about MacDonald as a man ahead of his time. And uh, then after the break, we will have Professor Keith, uh, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Garden, who is there next to the column. And who has just uh, finished a book on El Ghazali, and he will speak about uh, MacDonald as a reader of El Ghazali. Then we will have Yeheskel, who is there, who will speak about the last books written by uh, MacDonald about uh, the uh, Jewish Bible and the Hebrew genius uh, as uh, illustrated in the Bible. And finally, uh, if there is some time left, I will speak about uh, MacDonald's uh, sabbatical in Cairo in 1908. Uh, each speaker has been asked to speak for about 30 minutes, so that we have 15 minutes for question after each speaker. And uh, the President, uh, Professor Hatzel, will moderate the debate if they become too hot. <laughs> so, Jane, thank you for coming and good night to you. Professor Michaud uh, said that the title of my talk is uh, Duncan Black MacDonald, A Man Ahead of His Time, which is actually what it should have been titled. I said A Man Before His Time, and then I began to think about it and thought, well, that was kind of silly. So we'll work through and probably come to a change in the title when we get to the end. It's been uh, a number of years since I first stood in uh, this place, in this room. Uh, lots of things happen as the years go by, and for me, one of them, uh, uh, alas, is an um, increasing problem with my back. So I will try to get through my presentation standing, but uh, I hope you will bear with me if it's necessary for me to sit down and continue uh, from that position. So. After 10 years of having served as Associate Director of the Duncan Black McDonald Center, I have been forced by this conference to learn something about this remarkable man. <laughs> <laughs> While I've been reading for several months now, I have to confess that the span of his productive years and his devotion to the written word, meaning that he wrote an awful lot over a long period of time, leave me with much yet to read and think about. So my comments here may point us in a certain direction, but can't be taken as a definitive word. My task today is to consider MacDonald as a Christian Islamicist, to see how he viewed the religion of Islam, and to venture an opinion as to how he may have helped the seminary turn the corner in its move from mission to dialogue. I can tell you right now that the picture isn't as clear as I had hoped, and that the best we can do, I think, is to look at some of the hints he has provided for us 
across the wide range of his writings. So, to start with, let's try to draw an imaginary line up the middle of this podium, like this, and suggest that MacDonald and his various ideas might be seen from either of two perspectives. The first one would be this. His primary goal is the propagation of the Christian faith. Thus, he dedicated himself and his work to the best possible education of missionaries so that they might convert people of other faiths, specifically, in this case, Muslims. Seen from this perspective, one would probably need to argue that he was a man of his time, that he reflected the general outlook of Christian missionary theologians in thinking about Islam. He had little use either for Muhammad the politician and lawmaker, or for Islamic theology and philosophy. And unfortunately, he had a few uh, somewhat negative things to say about the religion of Islam itself. This is over here now. Given this, one might conclude that MacDonald was not the pioneer of the new way to understand Islam that has come to represent the program of the Hartford Seminary. Or, one might say, or hear, that his primary goal was the better understanding of Islam including linguistics and scholarly study of the faith. MacDonald was fortunate to have been able to find a way to teach Arabic in America by, quote, smuggling it into the Hartford Seminary curriculum. That was his word. The training of missionaries thus became the vehicle by which he engaged the academic study of Islam. He did very much like the figure of Muhammad as poet and mystic. He did like mystical Sufism, as you'll hear later from Stephen, especially on his Abbey. And he did greatly appreciate the Quran for its cadence and poetry. From this perspective, one might be tempted to agree with our doctoral student, Suindam Barinchi, who said in a Muslim World article several years ago that MacDonald, quote, is arguably the most important individual guiding Hartford Seminary's transition from missionary enterprise into interfaith dialogue. I think that each of these perspectives can be argued on the basis of some of the things that MacDonald has written. As a Christian Islamicist, he sat, in other words, on both sides of this arbitrary dividing line. The question is whether MacDonald himself would have imagined these two enterprises to be as distinguishable as many of us at Hartford Seminary today seem to think. In all likelihood, I suspect that he did not. So, what are some of the things that MacDonald thought and wrote about Islam and its constituent elements? Let's look at a quick sample of some of the remarks he made over decades of writing about Islam looking specifically for responses to Prophet Muhammad himself, to the Islamic understanding of Allah, to the Quran, and to Islam as a religion and as a historical phenomenon. So first, just a bit of what he had to say about Muhammad. As suggested earlier, MacDonald's respect for the person of Muhammad seems rather to have depended on what aspect of his prophethood was under consideration. As MacDonald himself was deeply attracted to a pious, mystical approach to religion, his most sympathetic responses to Muhammad seem to be when that mystical side is reflected. For the rest of it, one gets the feeling that he tries very hard to be fair to the prophet. Thus he writes, and I think this is very important, whatever may be our judgment on the character and influence of Muhammad, we will not question that he was a very great man. MacDonald was certain that Muhammad never doubted that he had access to the world of Allah. Quote, God had revealed himself to him and he had been able to receive this revelation. 
Muhammad also accessed the unseen world in general through the state of altered consciousness into which he fell as a, quote, primitive, incoherent, ecstatic type of poet, in other words, a soothsayer. He was a wali, friend of Allah, before he became a prophet with a specific message for humanity, said McDonald. It's when Muhammad moved from the status of kahin, poet, and ecstatic that he seems to have dropped somewhat in McDonald's estimation. He forgave Muhammad his transition into being, quote, a most disjointed and chaotic thinker on the grounds that the emotional reality of his faith was so strong that he didn't care much about expressing it systematically. I got the feeling that MacDonald was torn not only between the two different dimensions of the prophet's mission as poet and lawmaker, but between the general negative critique of his day and generation and his own inclination that he would have quite enjoyed getting to know Muhammad. Still, he was sometimes a bit more harsh in his criticism of the prophet as the founder of the religion of Islam. Quote, he was essentially a pathological case with an unbalanced psyche, he remarked, shining a different light on the spiritual side of the prophet. Of his later mission in life, Muhammad did have little appreciation. Quote, Muhammad abused his prophetic role and his power in the last years of his life. Reflecting on his own current day, i.e. the early years of the 20th century, Muhammad called the prophet an enormous liability for modern Islam, a peril to the unity of Islam. He said at one point that when the facts of Muhammad's life became better known, a tremendous overturning would be inevitable. Reflecting a belief, I think, of colleagues such as Samuel Zweymer, that Islam was entering into its last days as a viable world religion. Little did they know. <laughs> Muhammad, of course, was a man of his age and finding it difficult to reconcile the different dimensions of the prophet's life and teaching. Our colleague here, Noam Bielefeld, in his valuable reflections on a century of Arabic and Islamic studies at Hartford Seminary, remarked that the most serious flaw in McDonald's overall work is the failure to do justice to Muhammad, to somehow try to reconcile what appears to be the radical dichotomy in the prophet's life. But unlike most of his Christian colleagues of the time, McDonald never doubted the authenticity of Muhammad's original experience. In the West, in the West, he said, it has long been held that Muhammad was an imposter. Nothing could be further from the truth. The man was real. Then, what did he have to say about Allah? Insofar as Islam is a spiritual religion, it, quote, knows the relation in the spirit between God and man. In McDonald's day, they still said man. Thus, he saw Allah as a kind of spiritual partner with man. MacDonald also greatly appreciated the Muslim practice of citing the most beautiful names of God, saying that, quote, the only basis on which to work out a doctrine of the nature of Allah as developed in the Quran is to be found in these beautiful names. Observing a Muslim dhikr, he said, makes it clear that, quote, for these worshipers, there is a complete release of the emotional life from its normal inhibitions and a complete turning of that life to a beatific vision of God himself, to a scene in the Muslim phrase of the face of God. But then MacDonald became more critical of the Quranic Allah. And when I say then, I'm not talking chronologically, I'm talking about the other side that he seems to have expressed in his writings. He expresses appreciation for the Christian ability to anthropomorphize God, to make God in human form, 
through the imagery of the sonship. What he calls theological, I can't even say it myself, theologizing Islam, however, based on the Quranic vision of God, seems to have feared this anthropomorphizing, making human so much that it, quote, sought by cunning dialectic to avoid it, and therefore condemned its Allah to negotiations and unthinkableness. His primary concern seems to have been with the basic Islamic concept that human beings are slaves to God. We should not try to translate Ab to mean servant, he said, as we tend, I think, to do today, because the Quran really means that the relationship be to, is between God and God's slaves or human beings. The absoluteness of Allah over everything is preserved. Said. But here we have the paradox. While Islam can be a spiritual religion, recognizing the relation between human and divine, making devotion possible. According to MacDonald, it is also Calvinism run wild. <laughs> the paradox goes back to Prophet Muhammad himself, who on the one hand was a genuine saint, in MacDonald's opinion, in communion with God, and on the other, was uncompromising as to the absoluteness, the utter otherness of Allah, which of course ran counter to McDonald's Christians' presuppositions. In short, he found the Allah of Islamic theology too distant and too arbitrary. I apologize that these are all just brief little glimpses, little snapshots into the flow of his writing. So then to look quickly at what some of what he said about the Quran. MacDonald also sent different messages concerning his appreciation of the holy book of Islam. On the one hand, he showed what he called great respect and appreciation for the musical cadence of the Quran and said, the Quran is the supreme flowering of the genius of its language, its cadences still intoxicating, and endless repetitions have not staled its melodies. It's really lovely. Unlike most Christian theologians of his time, he didn't quite accuse Muhammad of authoring the text, though he did say, quote, his mind is laid out before us in the Quran. While it is an un critical text, he said, nonetheless, quote, it is trustworthy throughout. This is the Quran. And it gives up access to the central fact of Islam, the personality and religious experience of the Prophet. But beyond appreciating Muhammad's personal experience and the lyric qualities of the Quran, MacDonald appears to have had difficulties with the text calling it, quote, a jumbled recollection of Christian tradition proclaimed by a trans medium. In the same article in which he exalted the cadence and melody of the Quran, he, as he, he also discussed its poverty and one-sidedness and lamented that it revealed a religion of stunted growth, even though it came from the same stock as Christianity and Judaism. One can almost feel a sense of regret in his voice as he concluded that there is nothing there to spur to intellectual exertion, to pondering over the problems of life and of nature. The map is fixed. Nothing is left to seek or to improve. Then a few comments about the religion of Islam itself from McDonald. He found it hard to escape the long-standing, many, many centuries old prejudice that Islam is a Christian heresy. It may help, he said, to remember that Islam, essentially in its origin and through its theological development, has been and is a Christian heresy. Strivings for the divine spirit within Islam, said MacDonald, have been variously colored, biased, and stunted by Islam itself with its strange inheritance from we know not what Christian heresy. He always seems to have been torn between his reading of the Islamic texts 
and his observation of living Islam. In the same article, he called Islam a dead religion, but then he said it is vigorous, active, and dynamic. You can just feel these tensions going on in his mind and his expression. Repeatedly in his writings, MacDonald gave his opinion that Islam as a system of law and doctrine was not conducive to the construction of civilization. Islam is militant, vestigial, meaning it doesn't share any significant portion of modern life. It provides no historical sense to either the intellectuals or the masses and has, quote, never seriously resolved, addressed, and finalized the question of faith and reason. He found Muslim theology to be inadequate, but expressed even greater criticism of Muslim philosophy, which he said was contradictory, inadequate, irrational, and doomed from the start by the inability of the Oriental mind to think clearly. It's funny to read these and, and see them in the context of the long history of Christian struggle to try both to understand Islam and to, to credit it with the kind of uh, sense and meaning that they have felt at the same time that they're so, I would say, weighted down with Christian presuppositions. While Muslims inherited the burden of conveying Greek philosophy to the West, he said, they did so without understanding it, so that in the end, they passed on confusion. There's never been such a thing as Arabian science or philosophy. While Europe experienced the Renaissance, Islam has continued in medievalism. Wherever an Islamic government has been established, one finds, quote, inevitable decadence. But the problem is how to explain the fact, he says, that Muslim civilization has not only survived, but it's flourished. And he wants to say, in spite of Islam. At times, MacDonald joined fellow Christian thinkers in wondering if Islam would not expire in the near future. But sometimes he put it a bit differently. Quote, Islam will survive, not because of Muhammad's model of Muslim ethical discrimination, still less by its ability to reconcile its tradition with the modern movements of the 20th century. What he believed seems to me, I'd love to have some conversation about this, is that the future of Islam is in its mystical path, no surprise, but ultimately Christianity lies at the end of that path when missionaries are able successfully to lead Muslims to a complete and Christian marriage of reason and faith. In the long run, MacDonald was certain that if the truths of Christianity are correctly presented to Muslims, which was, after all, one of his stated objectives, they will be understandable and finally acceptable. If, for example, the Muslim understands Christ as presented in the prologue to the Gospel of John, the Muslim will assent to that broad truth. The concept of the cosmic Christ has close parallels in Islam, he said, particularly with the light of Muhammad doctrine, and will appeal especially to those of a more philosophical and mystical mind. It seems little surprise, at least to me, that the title of a Muslim World article written late in his career, 1935, bears the title, The Unity of the Mystical Experience in Islam and Christendom. This is what he was really, really looking for. Despite MacDonald's various levels of critique of Islam and his clear hopes for conversion of Muslims to Christianity, the fascination he expressed from early in his academic career with the Islam of the people, their mysticism, magic, storytelling, is never lost. He says, I would bear my testimony now that when I did meet the Muslim world face to face, the picture of its workings and ideas and usages which I had gained from these romances, poems, and religious tales needed modification in no essential point, almost even in no detail. So, where does this leave us? 
It remains for those more thoroughly conversant with the writings and lectures of Duncan Black MacDonald to reflect on the subtle changes in his opinion about Muslims and Islam that may have occurred over the course of his many years of professorship at this institution. I've taken a more generalized overview. So, what then can I conclude about the matter of whether he helped the seminary move from mission to dialogue? As there are many nuances in McDonald's thinking about Islam, so this question, too, is not given to an easy answer. Gordon Pruitt, in his generally helpful summary of McDonald as a Christian Islamicist, concludes that despite the sympathy he may have had for Muslims and a shared sense of spiritual reality, in the end, says Pruitt, he, McDonald, judges and finally condemns. I don't think so. That was not the full impression that I got through my reading. Some things about Islam, clearly, he did condemn. <laughs> But the enthusiasm he shared about many other elements in Islam can't be denied. MacDonald was among the leaders of those Christian thinkers of his day who tried hard to grasp the facts of Islam and to see it, at least to some degree, on its own terms. In one of many letters written to his student, Murray Titus, this was in 1923, he said, Titus was process of writing a book. McDonald said, you will remember that you will have two very different classes of readers, the missionaries and the Muslims. Now, I don't think you need mine being understood, misunderstood and criticized by the missionaries. Your point is not to unduly and unnecessarily antagonize your Muslim readers. And I like this sentence. Make them feel that you are trying to be fair and also that you see under the surface to the true ideas of both faiths. Among the great challenges for Christian mission in the 20th century has been the increasing necessity of dealing theologically with non-Christian religions and the growing tension between the evangelical emphasis on witness and the ecumenical emphasis to dialogue. Impetus. McDonald's career before and after the great Edinburgh World Missionary Conference in 1910 clearly reflects that tension. One of the major players at Edinburgh, together with McDonald, was Anglican missionary W.H. Temple Gardner, who came the next year to be McDonald's student here at Hartford. Gardner, perhaps under the scholarly influence of McDonald, was encouraged to moderate his often hostile approach to Islam, first of all, by changing the name of his 1908 volume, The Reproach of Islam, in which he referred to Islam as rigid and unintelligible, this is Gardner, to the slightly more moderate title in 1920, The Rebuke of Islam. Gardner wanted MacDonald to give him, quote, smashing arguments against Muslims. In a letter written in 1928 to Titus, MacDonald said, I told him, Gardner, what he needed instead was to understand Islam from the inside, to creep into the Muslim mind and discover how it felt there. This sounds to me very much like the admonition of my own mentor and teacher, Wilfred Campbell Smith, writing decades later about how to understand the faith of other people. Almost done. So did MacDonald help Hartford Seminary to turn the dialogue corner? Perhaps not quite in the way that my student Suendam wants to suggest. But I would argue that by his very openness to the spiritual dimension of Islam, by his appreciation of the cadence and poetry of the Quran, and the mystical vocation of the prophet, and by his insistence that his students, missionaries in training, know the facts about Islam and not get lost in their prejudgments. MacDonald was, in this way, I believe, a leader in the effort to understand Islam in a new way. And you have to really think about 
what the milieu was at that time in which he was writing. Certainly he served, unwittingly or not, as an early contributor to that movement within the church of the 20th century to try to blend evangelism with better interfaith understanding. Falcon Black MacDonald was certainly a man of his time to some extent, but also perhaps before his time. Or maybe it should be said, um, as Yahya did, that he was ahead of his time. Whatever the right preposition, I thoroughly enjoyed spending time with this giant of the seminary's history, who, like his evangelical successor, Kenneth Craig, brought to his work a careful attempt to balance his inner convictions and opinions with rigorous and scholarly study of language, scripture, and history.